a warm welcome. Herzlich willkommen, benvenuti al Neu Tech Park. Uh, today we need to inform, we need to inform, to exchange and to connect about a hot or better a cool topic, thermal management, becoming more and more important uh, and a key competence. Um, my name is Johannes Brunner. I'm responsible for automotive automation here in Neutech Park. I will guide you today through this event. The English, I hope the English language uh, is uh, perfect for the today event. Everybody agrees to continue in English. Um, so you can ask the questions then also in your uh, favorite language and we will try to respond in the right language. So, your value added at the end of this afternoon will be, you will get an overview and an insight of different aspects of thermal management. You will get to know, meet and interact directly with experts from research, automotive, electronics, manufacturing industry, as well as with uh, startups or service suppliers, especially in the coffee break and after the event at the Aperitivo in the Neusteria, you should uh, uh, use this as much as possible. So, and finally, you should be able to discuss also your challenges and prepare future R&D projects. We can support you along this, uh, this way. But before, you can listen now to our experts. Let's ask our director for technology transfer and innovation management, Vincent Moroy, for his welcome words. Vincent. Yep. Thank you, Johannes. Uh, welcome uh, to everybody. So it's a pleasure for me to be here. And uh, I like very much that topic. So uh, for those who know me, a few here in the room, I come from automotive uh, originally. So. Uh, Thermal management is something uh, that I also uh, had a lot of focus on and uh, I think it has also a big uh, future um, because at the end it's, it's becoming a core competence, thermal management. Uh, at the beginning, maybe 15, 20 years ago, it was a physical problem to solve, but I think it's uh, always more and more important that uh, you know what is thermal management and you have also some special skills uh, for yourself as a company, um, but especially also because it is really touching every industry. We are talking about, of course, electronics. We are talking about automotive. We have also some projects uh, also in energy, uh, where it's also always more and more responsible, uh, important. And um, the problem is always that uh, if things go beyond your own core competence, how can you do it? And normally you can only do it together with other people. And, uh, and there's a lot of movement going on uh, in the field of new materials also that are being used, uh, phase change materials, uh, insulating materials that can be used also in thermal management solutions. And there it's important that we bring together all the possible parties like research and uh, the companies and also funding to bring forward uh, and enable also uh, solutions working together. So that's uh, the, the reason also why we organize that because we, we have a lot of requests related to thermal management in different sectors. And uh, as you know, in Neutech Park, we organize events according to topics that... Uh, should have some interest and also to network. That's why we are here. And if we can help you afterwards uh, to bring forward your uh, research and development endeavor, then uh, we are glad to discuss that in the break or eventually at the end. Thank you. And I hand over to Johannes. You will then hand over to... Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. So now let's ask our first uh, speaker to climb the stage or to come here in front. It's uh, Massimiliano Renzi. Since 2012, he's assisted uh, professor for fluidic systems and energy systems at the University of Bolzano. He received his master's degree in mechanical engineering and his PhD uh, in, uh, from, at the Polytechnical University of Marke. He's shareholder of the company Strategy SRL, owning two patents, and was in charge of several um, research projects, like, for example, one with uh, Röchling, which is also present here today. 
and the author of many scientific publications in his field of expertise. So, to you the stage, Massimiliano, nice to have you here. Maybe just a technical support to uh, make it widescreen. very much. Thank you very much, Johannes and Vincent, for, for your introduction. I have to say that I was really happy to give this speech when Johannes asked me to do so. Uh, actually, it's very, very challenging to talk about such a big topic, uh, uh, so complex in, in half a minute. So I will try to um, give just an overview of the problem uh, of the thermal management, and I hope, of course, it will be useful uh, uh, afterwards for the upcoming speech. So, so as you perfectly know, uh, nowadays uh, we are living really a revolutionary era for uh, the automotive sector because new technologies, new trends are coming. Of course, most important one is electrification, but we have also autonomous driving. We have the availability of connectivity sensors uh, that are really game changing. So. Uh, if we talk about thermal management, of course, this means that we are going to have new thermal requirements, so new design goals uh, for our systems and for our components, and also that we are going to have completely different architectures, uh, in particular of the powertrain. Fortunately, we also have new tools, uh, new tools that will definitely help us uh, in uh, producing new design and new components. Most of the components, indeed, uh, that are nowadays available in the market maybe are best fitting uh, the previous architectures and design goals uh, of powertrain. So we need to start over, let's say, uh, in the design. And of course, to do so, many skills are required. First of all, for sure, thermofluid dynamics is the most important one. But of course, it's becoming more and more important system modeling and integration. We will see it's really important to consider all the system, not the single components and of course optimization. So very, very quickly, why thermal management? Uh, as you perfectly know, thermal management is needed to extend the lifespan of batteries, to extend range, uh, to allow super fast uh, charge, uh, but we have to keep in mind that there is also the necessity to embed the thermal management of the storage unit with the other thermal managed systems. So for example, also comfort of the occupants of the passengers and other electronic device. So why do we need to control the thermal, uh, the temperature of the batteries? Uh, as you perfectly know, there are some electrochemical uh, um, processes that can take place when the current is passing in the, in the battery. Uh, we have uh, for sure also simply very ohmic uh, uh, heating, uh, joule heating and so on, but we need to keep in mind also uh, the importance of the safety. And as you perfectly know, thermal runaway is a very critical aspect that needs to be taken into account. As concerns the typology of batteries, uh, as you perfectly know, there are plenty of chemistries and solutions that have been developed. Some of them are better used for uh, energy density, other for uh, power uh, management, and also different layouts like cylindrical cells, pouch cells, prismatic cells. Of course, uh, they Every choice influences a little bit the thermal management system, but uh, besides this, uh, in general, all the batteries like to work in a very narrow range of operation of temperature, typically between 15 and 35 Celsius degrees. If we go below, the problem is the higher internal resistance, so lower efficiency. Moreover, batteries don't like to have high currents, a low temperature, so uh, fast charge is not nice. Uh, uh, energy recovery too, and if we go really below a certain level, we have also uh, the risk of having few capacity or even impossibility to use the battery. If we go up instead with the temperature, the problem is mainly due to the degradation and very um, quick uh, uh, aging 
of the cell. So it will shorten its lifetime. If we go above 90, 100 Celsius degrees, then we also have safety issues. So the thermal runaway. Other critical aspect is not only to keep the temperature in that range, but also with a very good homogeneity. So all the cells of the pack should be, they say, in between five degrees of temperature difference maximum. This is very challenging because the battery itself uh, for its construction characteristics is not homogeneous inside. As you know, there are many layers. There are uh, preferred paths for the heat. And of course, uh, for the characteristic of the cooling system or heating system that we have for the cells, uh, it is impossible to grant for every cell exactly the same thermal management. So it, also this requirement is extremely challenging. Things become even worse, more difficult, <laughs> if we consider that cells are very, very packed in uh, our battery pack. We don't have single cells, but we have modules, uh, pack, and so on. So things uh, become really, really complex. To come to the battery thermal management systems, uh, we can say that there are mainly three big groups uh, uh, of cooling solutions that we can adopt. Air cooling solutions, liquid cooling solution, and phase change solutions. We will really quickly have a look at all of them, of course, highlighting pros and cons, starting with the air cooling. For, this is for sure the very first one that was developed, very simple, low weight, uh, easy to handle and manage. But of course, nowadays, for the requirements of uh, thermal management systems, it might not be sufficient. The capacity, of course, for the thermodynamic properties of air, of cooling the batteries, is not ideal. Um, in terms of optimization, of course, it is important to define the paths of the air, uh, and of course, also the cooling uh, solutions like fans uh, to improve the heat convection, but we have limitations. The state of the art today is instead liquid cooling and in particular indirect liquid cooling. It means that we don't have a direct contact, of course, of the cooling system, of the cooling liquid with the battery. We have an intermediate uh, mother that is typically a channel or some kind of uh, uh, path for the water. This, of course, uh, means that we can improve the capacity of cooling. Uh, it's much easier also to integrate the cooling uh, uh, system with the other thermal management system of the vehicle, like heat pumps, uh, resistors, and so on. But of course, uh, higher complexity, higher cost, higher weights, and so on. We have also the risk of uh, cooling uh, uh, liquid leakage, of course. Uh, in the picture, on top, uh, in particular, you can see a solution that is typically used, uh, uh, for example, in uh, uh, Tesla uh, so, um, battery packs uh, that are based on cylindrical cells. There are these wavy heat exchangers that pass through the different cells to have a good homogeneity. However, solutions are different depending on the, also on the characteristic of the cells. For example, here on top, instead, you can see a solution that is based on cold plates. So in the middle, we have the battery modules on top of the electronic part. In the bottom, instead, the so-called cold plates. That are the points where we drain the heat produced by the cells. Of course, here the challenge is to, first of all, place the, cool, uh, the cold plates, but also to deliver the heat from the cell to the cold plate. So it's very, very crucial and important in an optimization process to uh, define metallic fins, typically they are aluminum, that are placed in between one cell and the other. You can see a sketch uh, instead in the picture on the bottom. And of course, also thermal pads that help in uh, delivering the heat to the uh, cold plate. In terms of optimization, in here, of course, the most critical part is the topology optimization. So what is the shape of the uh, heat exchangers of the cold plates in order to optimize uh, the um, passage of heat. And of course, in here, a competence, an important competence is CFD, okay? There are also novel solutions, for example, bio-inspired solution based on microchannels. I don't know how, if they are going to be feasible, let's say, on a practical point of view, but for sure, there are researches in this direction. New solutions that are coming uh, and probably will be adopted in the next years. One of them is the direct liquid cooling. In here, instead, the battery is really inserted 
under inside the uh, cooling medium liquid typically. Of course, the advantage is that we remove all the uh, um, resistances. Um, the cooling effect is much better. Homogeneity of temperature is much better. Also, we have the advantage of preventing the thermal runaway in a much easier way because the battery is in inside the cooling liquid. But of course, there are other criticalities, criticalities. In particular, of course, the choice of the coolant. It is to be, needs to be a coolant with good thermal properties, but of course, preventing the passage of currents, so short circuits and so on. There are many solutions, mineral oils, the electric fluids and so on. Of course, uh, the problem comes with the cost, uh, the weight of the solution, material compatibility, which makes really still quite complex to adopt. Uh, in terms of optimization, also here, definitely CFD, uh, thermal fluid dynamic optimization is important. Choice of the liquid is uh, definitely critical. Other option, quite interesting, is the phase change. Phase change means finding uh, uh, proper materials that have a phase change, typically from solid to liquid, but also to, from liquid to um, vapor, that change phase in the range of operation of the batteries, so in the range 1535. The advantage, obviously, here is that we can exploit this constant temperature that we have in the phase change, um, which grants a much higher uh, heat flux and possibility to cool down the batteries, but also to keep the temperature very, very homogeneous. Also here, the batteries are completely inserted in the phase change material, and currently we have two big options. Either organic materials, so paraffin-based materials mainly, or inorganic materials that, of course, all have uh, advantages and disadvantages. In some cases, uh, phase change materials uh, uh, can be passive, which means that we don't need additional solutions uh, to keep the system running, so just exploiting the phase change. But of course, if we want a much higher thermal performance, uh, hybrid systems are, are used, which means we couple the phase change with another cooling uh, solution that can be liquid, air, whatever other uh, solution that we have already discussed before. Important is also to increase the thermal properties of phase change materials because thermal conductivity is not ideal, uh, let's say, in these materials. So in many uh, research uh, applications, they are trying to introduce, for example, carbon powders or some kind of metal foams to improve the thermal characteristics of these materials. Obviously, there are also some cons, some complexities. First of all, the encapsulation of the phase change material around the, the cells. And moreover, again, the characteristics uh, of the phase change material that lose in performance, of course, when we subcool or superheat them. So we go out of the uh, phase change uh, um, part of, this, uh, of these materials. And moreover, it's not easy to control uh, the phase change. So also this is still critical and needs to be uh, analyzed in better details. However, there are definitely much and um, very, very interesting outcomes from this technology. Last one I would like to talk about are the heat pipes. In here, um, the concept, of course, is pretty similar to the previous one. Uh, we don't have phase change materials, but we have a liquid that changes phase also, um, and that enters in contact with the cells uh, through very, very small pipes, uh, capillary uh, systems, that, of course, can exploit uh, this capillary effect as well as the phase change uh, to maintain uh, the temperature of the cell in the uh, proper required range. The advantages are, of course, very low use of power uh, because the pumping is very limited in here, exploiting the capillary effect. Uh, we need, of course, uh, to couple this with another uh, system, cooling system, because in the condensation zone, so far from the cell, we need to reject uh, some amount uh, of it. Other critical aspect uh, is the loss of performance when we have strong temperature fluctuations. So also this has to be taken into account. Let's move now to novel technologies that are coming to the market uh, and that, of course, are going to uh, somehow uh, influence the choices in the thermal management. One of those are solid-state batteries. These are, have been discussed really widely in the, in the industry. 
The concept behind this technology is that we remove the liquid electrolyzer and we replace it with a solid electrolyzer. What are the advantages? Mainly, most important one is packing, so the cells can be made much, much smaller, so much higher energy density, much higher thermal stability and longevity of the battery, but also completely different, different thermal requirements. The operating temperatures typically are a bit higher compared to the other cells. Uh, someone claims that it is possible to uh, drive them up to 100 Celsius degrees without any, any issues, and also that the cooling requirements are so simple that can be almost uh, uh, removed. In my opinion, probably some kind of cooling is definitely uh, required. Still, there is much research work uh, in the uh, selection of the uh, electrolyte, but for sure this technology is coming to the market in the range of four or five years maximum. What are the critical aspects of solid state batteries? High internal resistance. So that's why also we need to work at a slightly higher temperature, preferably between 50 and 70 degrees, and unfortunately still low capacity of handling high currents. So when it comes to fast charge, these kinds of batteries are still critical. And also, on the industrial point of view, they are a bit difficult to uh, scale up. Again, instead, for what concerns novel aspects, definitely a, a new, uh, let's say, driver uh, in the design of the battery pack is the so-called cell-to-pack solution, which means uh, removing the traditional architecture cell module pack and going directly from the cell to the pack. But advantages are clear, the energy density can be increased uh, a lot, uh, up to 50%, but also very interesting is the possibility to integrate the battery system in the architecture of the vehicle, so it will be definitely easier to integrate it, uh, and also to use the cells with some structural uh, advantage. Of course, uh, higher packing, more difficult the uh, thermal control. Um, also, in this case, uh, it is important to optimize the thermofluid dynamic design. We also lose in terms of modularity. Modules, of course, can be easily replaced. Uh, and also, uh, in general, for the safety, uh, on the safety side, uh, so thermal runaway can be critical. Because also, in this case, modules can somehow prevent or limit the, the um, uh, diffusion of the thermal runaway uh, issue. Other new interesting uh, things that are coming uh, into the market. As you know, uh, the um, miniaturized sensors and the low-cost electronics, also flexible electronics, will play a, a very, very important role in the next future. Nowadays, we have systems uh, called BMS, so battery management system, that control the battery at the level of groups or modules or even the entire pack, while it will be possible in the next few years, probably to have a control, uh, an overview on the single um, cells. Uh, for example, it will be possible to monitor voltage, temperature of the uh, single cells, which makes the management much, much easier, and also the possibility to control and balancing all the cells, uh, also on a thermal point of view, in a much better way. Of course, uh, all of this data needs to be handled. And uh, a solution that we can use, uh, of course, are the new big data um, solutions that are coming. For example, machine learning or artificial intelligence. What does it mean? We can collect all this data, but also external data like environmental conditions uh, or even the uh, driver uh, style of, uh, uh, of driving to predict what is going to be the thermal requirement of our battery pack and so uh, pre uh, prepare in advance uh, the heating or the cooling according to the, uh, to the requirements. Now let's move instead to the uh, vehicle integration because we can optimize really every single component but if we don't consider that it has to be introduced in a wider system then things uh, become a bit uh, uh, or not optimized on a, an overall point of view. Integration means that we need to take into account, for example, also the other electronic components, electric motors, uh, um, uh, inverters, and so on, but also the cabin heating, for example. And if we don't take and optimize all the system, then things uh, are not going to be ideal. 
Management is really, really critical. Uh, as you perfectly know, when we are in very cold climates or very hot climates, uh, we need uh, to, or we can expect a reduction of the uh, vehicle range up to 30%, so extremely critical, and the uh, use of the heat pump system for electric resistors uh, are definitely fundamental. So again here, optimization is very, very important. And of course, very, very important role of the control valves uh, that manage all these circuits, cooling systems, and so on. An example is this uh, octovalve, uh, it's manufactured by uh, Tesla, which as you can see is very, very complex. It is able to handle really a lot of circuits uh, and uh, uh, cooling solutions to combine them depending on the requirements. Sometimes we need to heat somewhere and cool somewhere else. Obviously it comes to a cost, uh, complexity, pressure losses, uh, difficult control. Just to give you an example, in, with this valve it is possible to handle 11 heating strategies and three cooling strategies, so extremely complex system. So if you ask me what is the pathway that I can suggest to develop a thermal management system for an electric vehicle, I will suggest to follow uh, this kind of path. The starting point is definitely data coming from experimental tests on the electric and thermal characteristics and performances of the cell. From that, we can develop models to, of course, forecast the performances and to move to an early design that is typically based on a monodimensional uh, design of the cooling system, of the arrangement of the cells, and so on. From that, we can move to the three-dimensional analysis, so a very detailed and accurate thermofluid dynamic uh, uh, analysis of the components and also topology optimization of the different systems. And finally, we need, of course, to take into account also the wall system, the wall thermal management system of the vehicle. Of course, uh, taking advantage of the uh, big data analysis uh, um, tools uh, that we have nowadays. And for sure, this solution needs to be iteratively repeated uh, till we reach the uh, optimum. Skills required uh, in uh, the design of a battery thermal management system, of course, very, very wide um, requirements. Uh, uh, probably a staff of people would be required, definitely. Uh, skills can start from the thermodynamics, uh, fluid dynamics, but of course nowadays very, very important is modeling, coding, uh, and also skills uh, in the field of optimization techniques that can be adopted at different levels, uh, as we have said. To conclude, just a couple of projects um, that we carried out at the University of Bolzano in the field of uh, uh, thermal management and in general electric vehicles. The first one I would like to talk about is a project that we have carried out in collaboration with Rockling Automotive. I'm happy that today also we have probably some prototypes uh, uh, regarding this project. And the goal, um, the name of the project is Cool Car. Uh, the goal was to develop a battery module that had some peculiar thermal management characteristics. We started over following uh, exactly the same path uh, in the development that we've seen before. So starting from experimental tests on the batteries that we have selected, in this case pouch cells, in collaboration with the University of Augsburg. And through these uh, experimental tests, uh, we have developed a, a methodology to extract uh, from the experimental data all the parameters that were required for the electric and thermal model of the system that are then important to forecast the performances. Together with that, we also need, uh, run some tests uh, on the aging of the, of the battery and also some mechanical tests regarding the swelling uh, because in particular pouch cells tend to vary uh, their volume during their life uh, and also during the operation, which of course gives some important indication on the state of health of the, of the cell, but also for the mechanical design, of course, uh, uh, of the system. When we had all of this, uh, we started using the models, uh, first with uh, a one-dimensional tool. Uh, the university, we have developed an open source simulation tool. We will uh, deliver it in, uh, in a few weeks. Uh, that is intended for a preliminary design of the model, given the requirements course, and then we moved instead to a more detailed 
three-dimensional three, uh, three, uh, uh, thermofluid dynamic analysis of the system. Of course, this was repeated iteratively several times till we obtained an optimal solution. I reported here some pictures of the prototype. Actually, this was presented, uh, I think, uh, a year and a half ago, roughly, here at the Neutech Park. Uh, and of course, it is a, a good starting point, of course, to continue developing new, new solutions. Another project, this is a, a national uh, research project uh, in which the goal instead was to identify the optimal electrification pathways for agricultural machines. This is quite complex and challenging because agricultural machines have very high loads uh, and uh, uh, work cycles that of course make it diffi difficult to move them to electric. However, we tried to analyze all the energy flows uh, of, the, uh, of the tractor or the agricultural machine, considering also the implements, in order to identify which one could be electrified in order to make the thermal unit, so the traditional internal combustion engine, to work in optimal conditions too. To do this, we needed to run an optimization procedure. In this case, uh, it's an optimization, not thermofluid dynamic optimization, but based on dynamic programming, with the goals uh, that were reduction of fuel consumption, emissions, uh, thermal management, and so on. So multiple goals that needed to be uh, optimized. With constraints, obviously otherwise the goal would be to have it all electric, which is not possible because of the size of the battery and the cost of the system, so we have these constraints. The result of the uh, analysis in the end was the definition of the optimal configuration of the powertrain, which means uh, size of the battery pack, uh, size of the internal combustion engine, of the motors, and so on. Of course, uh, based on the workload, so on the characteristic of the machine that we needed to equip with this new powertrain. Last one uh, is another project with Rockling Automotive. In particular, this is a, an industrial PhD. I'm happy that today also Hermano uh, Grotti is here, which is the PhD student carrying out this work, uh, which was on the optimal design procedure of thermal management valves. Also here, you can see that the problem is very, very complex because to optimize uh, the valve, which looks maybe a single separate component from all the rest, we need instead to take into account all what we have around the valve. So starting from the vehicle dynamics, requirements of the different components that we have in the powertrain, to analyze the energy flows, and only in the end to go to the thermal management system and specifically the valve. Critical in the design of the valve is the fact that we have valves nowadays mainly developed for traditional systems, and so we need a solution at least for the early stage design of the valve. Also in this case, to do so, a multi-objective um, function needs to be considering, considered, taking into account all the possible sub-models that influence the performance and the characteristic of the valve. So for example, geometry, but also leakage, torque, uh, pressure drop, and so on. Putting together all these models, we identify a, a goal function to be uh, optimized through optimization techniques, and in the end, of course, uh, the design of the valve can be re-evaluated and redesigned, at least at the first stage, for optimizing the overall system, considering all the flows that we have in the, uh, in the uh, vehicle. Of course, then this can be further improved with uh, three-dimensional fluid dynamic simulations and so on. Last slide, uh, just to uh, present a new lab that we want to, to open at uh, the University of Bolzano. We are already starting uh, working uh, on it. Uh, of course, uh, we want to develop even more our competencies and of course also equipment in the um, battery testing and thermal management. Uh, in this new lab, of course, we, will, we would like to apply uh, to uh, calls uh, for funding with the goal to uh, increase our equipment in the battery testing, in particular electric and thermal performance of the cell, but also uh, thermal chambers in order to be able to test uh, cooling solutions and novel, uh, let's say, thermal management solutions. We will also, of course, try to embed something uh, related to hydrogen, use of hydrogen in mobility, and in general, vehicle-to-grid applications. So with this, uh, I uh, conclude my presentation. Uh,
course, I will be happy to answer to any question or maybe to discuss it later if I'm a bit late. <laughs> Thank you very much, Massimiliano. Since we are perfect in time, there is also the possibility to ask uh, a question. If there is, Vincent. Somebody else first. Can you maybe elaborate on the capabilities that you have uh, related to modeling? So, what kind of tools do you need? Do you do you have? What can you do? And then the second question. Uh, how, wh where do you see the most potential with data, with AI and machine learning uh, to tackle uh, the problems? Thank you. Uh, in terms of modeling, we have developed our own uh, uh, modeling tool. Uh, it is based uh, on uh, the um, uh, thermal, thermal assets uh, uh, given to it. Uh, we decided to, to take this choice because to develop other tools uh, based on the electrochemistry would require uh, very, very accurate uh, data regarding the cell, which is quick and very difficult, perhaps. But if the goal is to analyze it on a, a general thermal point of view, electric point of view, it's more than sufficient. Uh, and we have used that tool then uh, coupled with the MSEM uh, tool uh, in order to, of course, take into account also the thermal uh, analysis of the system, the presence of the different layers, materials that we can have in a battery model or concerns uh, instead the use of new uh, tools uh, based on uh, big data. Um, I have used uh, quite often the artificial neural networks for personal data are also uh, deep learning tools uh, and the advantage of having so many data for sensors of course uh, will give the opportunity to have this predictive uh, analysis uh, of the uh, behavior of the cells. So for example spray kits or spray food cells uh, based uh, on the Expected uh, uh, requirements uh, uh, so that we can optimize or downsize many, many components compared to a simple traditional spray uh, design. Thank you. There was another question. Uh, thanks for your presentation. And uh, in uh, thermal cooling in battery, we will have some consideration for electrical uh, issues. And uh, can you give us some uh, uh, approximation for the order of electric field intensity in the batteries and uh, which fluids uh, usually used in uh, thermal cooling in the batteries? Yeah, um, actually strongly depends on the uh, typology of cell and the, and the packing level. Uh, in terms of um, uh, systems or cooling liquids, uh, that we have in indirect cooling systems. Normally we have traditional water and glycol uh, mixtures. Uh, in terms of uh, um, phase change materials, as you, as you have seen, there are mainly um, organic or non-organic uh, organic systems. Uh, and in terms of other direct cooling uh, solutions, uh, uh, for example, uh, there is also ethanol that can be used uh, that have very good dielectric uh, properties, so to uh, avoid uh, the, um, the arc, the electric arc mainly. Um, in terms of distances, it depends on the voltage really, uh, a lot that we have uh, in the different components to, to keep them uh, as, as far as possible, or as far as needed, let's say, uh, in order to prevent this kind of issues. Welcome. So, perfect. Thank you, Massimiliano, for your contribution. So let's come to our next uh, speaker. I invite to come here and to prepare for the presentation. So, uh, Dr. Carmen Schäfer, uh, Head of Research uh, and Development of the company Allopress in Brixen. Um, she holds a PhD in Metal Physics and Material Science from the uh, RTWH Aachen University. 
She worked uh, for different automotive suppliers where she contributed to projects like super light cars or uh, temperature resistant alloys for premium car manufacturers. Carmen also steers the Aluminum Technical Committee of the German Society for Materials, connecting science and industry in areas such as green aluminum, recycling, additive manufacturing, and life cycle assessment. Carmen, we are very curious about your talk. Thank you very much, Johannes. I'm glad to be here today. Good afternoon also from my side. So I think I need to stand a little bit closer, otherwise I'm moving usually a lot. <laughs> so uh, I have the pleasure today to show you also from a uh, manufacturer side. We are first, our uh, customers are first here, so we are classical second tier uh, Alupress in Brixen. And I have the chance to show you now how we can pay our contribution to the improvement of the thermal performance, combining aluminium die casting with laser beam work. So first of all, for some of you who might not know Alupress shortly who we are, then it's the general trends in power electronics as we are concerned as a die caster and the approaches from our side to how to improve it and finally concluding the talk. So Alupress, we are classical automotive die casting um, supplier, but we have more or less nowadays a full service solution. Um, to, to apply to the market, to provide at the market. That means we start at the beginning with a technological idea. That's where I come and play um, because originally we are a processing company. But that's the, that changes nowadays also with the requirements on the market. If we get um, the first part from, from one of our customers, we go into the development, consulting, project management and the whole processing chain. And usually that starts in the automotive sector with the A samples. So the A samples is just a geometry, and that means for us we need prototypes. As some of you know, um, we have also some additive printer in Alupress, but we have now externalized it in a startup called Adam in Brixen. So they can provide us, for instance, with the first prototypes, but starting from the B sample stage, we need die cast, to be in the die cast. And then we ramp up our process and going into 100, 300,000 pieces a year, of these components, that means the complete or mostly automized process. And finally, at some point, seven years later, the product ramps down. So this is the headquarter in Brixen. We have uh, some sites in uh, USA and South Carolina and in Germany, in Hildberghausen, where we have also the whole processing chain. And in Brixen, we have furthermore a tool shop, and they're providing us with 33% of our tools. The other ones we are sourcing externally. That's not a, a lot here, but uh, I stay with Brixen because we have all processes here and all central functions. So our major is, of course, aluminum. We are living for aluminum since 1965. <laughs> and nowadays, we also go a little bit more into magnesium because of weight issues. Battery, 100 kilos per car plus. We need to remove them somewhere. And um, this is an important point with the alloys. I want to come back later because these are all secondary alloys. We have lots of pressure on CO2 emissions, and that plays more and more a role, and they are quite good in a sense of CO2 emissions because it's the second life of these alloys. What can be cast? Um, we are not going into the giga casting, which is now everywhere in the news and on every conference and fair. We are really restricted with 1,400 tons, but you will see this is sufficient for power electronics, small battery casings, etc. The process itself, See here, we are automotive 60, I, I, IPF 6949, um, starting from the melt, going into the first cast apart, <coughs> punching, then blasting. We need to modify the surface because particles are a big issue, and with electronics, we need to remove them. That means everywhere you will find washing steps, machining and assembly, of course, and a, a huge part is actually you have here all this issue about technical cleanliness. We have a lab which uh, we, are, we are testing in accordance to EDA 19. It's very important in this, in this sector. And we're doing this several years. We are not new in this business. So uh, this is also what our customer like about uh, us in this sense. There are some post processes as well. 
that can be coatings, that can be also something like adhesives, but also laser welding, which is new and since 2021 in Brixen. And we have this now in series production, and I will come back to that in the next slides. So this is just one example of the products that we make. I just picked this for today, because more or less nowadays we are making more or less 70% yeah, 70 direction e-mobility components, and that means more and more power electronics for heat sinks, for small battery casings, or small e-motor housings. So the general market trends, I think we heard it already at the beginning quite a lot. So for us, this is just for the power electronics now. It will increase in the sector of e-mobility. We have uh, an integration of converter, inverter, and charger and controller. So there is a lot of movement at the moment for new components in the design. And we have more and more, um, when we look at this graph, exactly the example of what we heard before, liquid cooling. So this traditional, we had lots of heat sinks with air cooling. This is not sufficient anymore, especially since the sil silicon carbide um, chips are coming. Temperature rising to 165 peak. And um, that means we need to remove this more energy on the smaller uh, area, the dissipated area. And that means changes in packing density, changes in dimensions, but also find efficient thermal management solutions. So what does that mean for us as a die caster? Because as you see, these are not, uh, this is not a die casted component. Usually they are machined. They use the primary metals, which have a high CO2 in, um, imprint. Um, but we want to provide that also on a large scale. And there is, that is actually the strength of uh, die casting. And in this combination, we can provide cost-efficient thermal management solutions. But we have also some risks. Since we switched from the IC to the EV, that means for us as a die cast that the 200 die casting components that we had in the ICE has shrank down to a few tens, 30, 50 parts nowadays in die casting in the car, and that means huge competition. And there is another uh, thing, this is the modularization, because the manufacturers want to produce all over the world simplified yeah, components. And this is exactly what we are not doing. We want to be complex. But we, as you will see there is a combination. So just a um, few examples. Battery cooling, e-motor housing, power electronics, high-performance computing. These can be such the typical components that we can provide. So what are the opportunities here that drive the thermal management in this area? As I said already, is the power dissipation. So we need to remove the heat from the electronic stack into the heat sink or DC-DC housing. And we have on, on top um, increased performance requirements, smaller PCP footprint, smaller spacing, and that means again, more heat per area. And if we look at this graph, we see in 55% of the cases, these components, the electronic components, fail just because of temperature. And this we get just worse with the SEC chips, and that means we need to remove it. We need to reduce the temperature by 10 degrees, for instance, and we can double the lifetime of this component, more or less. And of course, we need for the more powerful chips per area, better efficiency. This is one of the components that we produce. So we produce the housing, and all the electronics is put by our customer inside. This is, for example, a Conti DC-DC housing. So what are the requirements to modern heat sinks? I put one graph here on the top. We are talking about liquid cooling, liquid cold plates. And if you pay attention, thermal resistance is supposed to be very low here. But at the same time, we have a huge price. No one actually wants to pay this on large scale. So our goal is to go down here, but with the same performance. That means we need to reduce component size and weight, which means it's cost, cost efficient. Liquid cooling is what we want, and of course, if you look into the stack, so we have here our heatsink or housing or whatever, and the electronics on top, you see exactly the heatsink aluminum is one of the big things, the big parts that we want to remove. So we want to reduce thermal resistance, improve thermal conductivity, reduce entry area temperature, and I'll show you how we try to tackle this. So it's more or less a multi-level approach system. We have the chance by using liquid joining technology as laser beam welding to reduce component size. We can apply topology optimization to improve the flow, to improve the 
the thermal performance of the components, we can change the material, and we can combine also um, near net shape technology such as sintering, for instance, or high impact extrusion with the die cast. This is just a prototype. This looks in, in reality later different. This is one of my prototypes to just show how to mix it up. And of course, everyone wants copper because it's a good heat spreader, but copper is expensive, copper is heavy. And this is like a hybrid heat sink where we apply on top a copper layer. So you could attach on this with soldering the electronics. And what's important, this is mostly a secondary alloy. So laser beam welding, you have here also the, the CO2 imprints that we have in the secondary alloy, also the heat conductivity, which is pretty bad. Um, and on the opposite side, that's usually what is used in the liquid coal, coal plates is a primary alloy, wrought alloy, which has a very bad impact on CO2, but of course has very nice heat conductivity. So what we can do with the laser beam welding, and I show you just a movie, is um, we can combine this, we get pressure tight components with very good leakage rates and we do not have to do a machining afterwards. Let's see if this is running. So this is now still a prototype process in production. It's running much faster because you will see in between the, 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 the welding some stops now. Uh, in total, this, pro, this component is welded in 30 seconds and the competing technology of friction steel welding takes at least one and a half to two minutes. So we have, depending on the alloy, an improvement in a velocity by a factor of five to 10. And this is again something that brings down our costs. And I can tell you in die casting, it's really not easy to do this. But we have managed it now, so it's now the second, uh, the second cycle is still coming. There was a break in the program, and that's it. So it's burst proof, 10 to 20 bar, and that's exactly where we apply it. So you see this is an e-motor, and there are two of these power electronic housings. With this you see the inlet, the cooling channel, the outlet, and that's where it's applied. It's a sportive car, it's a Maserati, and it's a DC-DC. So what are the benefits of laser beam welding? I have mentioned already friction steel welding. This is this process. Most of you know it. This is laser welding. And you see here middle already it's a huge difference. The one width is 8 millimeter for friction steel welding and I go down to 2 millimeter width in laser beam welding. The same properties for these applications. I can combine, of course, also die casting with whatever other process, for example, with other aluminum. And I have here already, by changing here the friction steer to laser beam welding, weight reduction of 30%. And this is more cost efficient, of course, as I said, it is five to 10 times faster. I mentioned this already earlier, this is one way. I wanted just to show you the number. This brings a little bit improvement because the heat conductivity is poor in this die cast alloy, 140 watt per meter Kelvin. But I can go a step further. I can change the material. If you don't need still the copper, the 400 watt per meter Kelvin, that's where we start with the die cast. And there are some other options in between that I can use and combine it with the die cast housing. So this is the cast body. You can put from one side a sheet cover to close the cooling channel and you can put whatever pin fin structure you want on the other side. Wavy structure, pin fins, diamond shape, whatever you can get out of your CFD simulations. And this is, I cannot show you the, the complete component right now because it's running up in production. This is actually such a part, it's a cold plate. There are five parts that are welded in and um, that increases, this is um, almost pure aluminum here, the pin fins. This is a huge jump in the, uh, in the thermal performance of this component. So we're coming slowly to the end. So I can combine good alloys, but I can also take various manufacturing processes such as sintering, impact extrusion or additive manufacturing and weld it in a die cast housing. And what I get from this is, for example, this is the thermal um, resistance that I mentioned at the beginning, which we want to push down. And this is not that well in, in a die cast housing. If I go with various conductivities down to the orange part, I have already a reduction of 33%. So we, if you add up now all the reductions that I showed, there is quite some potential still in the die cast housings without changing to a completely different system. We can combine everything and can generate, yeah, cold plates, power electronic housings, heat sinks, or battery coolings, 
that have a 30 to 60 percent improved thermal conductivity up to 30 percent improved thermal resistance plus we have a high complexity we can precast the, the, the bores the drill holes whatever so you don't need to fix it into another component it's very ma ready made for building in the car and you have of course then the, the laser beam welding gives us another weight reduction and you get a large volume scalable cost efficient solution and of course CO2 emissions the pressure is rising if I remove I take just the diecast housing and remove only the parts where I have the cooling benches and replace them with an expensive CO2 expensive alloy which has the better properties I have still a very good impact on CO2 this is a huge difference compared to the, to the, the commercial uh, solutions which are on top very expensive so with this, I want to close my talk, and I'm up for some questions. Thank you very much, Carmen, for this impressive uh, presentation. So as you, as you heard, uh, the automotive industry, they fight for every um, degree of, uh, <coughs> of uh, temperature, for every cent, of, uh, and for every gram of CO2. Yeah, exactly. So are there any questions from the audience? Otherwise, you have also then in the break the yeah. possibility to contact directly. Carmen, thank you again. You're so let's come. <laughs> let's come to our next speaker. Um, Alessandro De Nicolò, please come here in front. Uh, Alessandro uh, Nicolò is Vice President of uh, Engineering in uh, Global Small Components of GKN Powder Metallurgy in Bruneck. His expertise is in developing product sol uh, selections for customer quotes, overseeing customer commitments and coordinating tooling and design. He studied science and engineering at the uh, University of Trento, where he finished his thesis uh, on powder metallurgy already in the Fraunhofer Institute of Bremen in Germany. Um, his career at uh, JKN started in uh, 2008 in the product development manager, and in 2010 he became uh, engineering manager and uh, was promoted to his actual role. Uh, Alessandro, Thank please, you. for your you talk. For, uh nice introduction. Well, actually, uh, Carmen and uh, Professor Renzi made already half of my presentation, <laughs> so I can... Uh, no, uh, it's, uh, it's a huge topic, uh, thermal management, uh, and it's uh, my pleasure to, uh, to present you today uh, a little bit of what we are doing, how we are active in, in that field covering that need of the automotive industry. So, so uh, let me start uh, with, uh, uh, with a few, um, sorry about that. So who are we? Uh, GKN, uh, GKN Powder Metallurgy is a, is a huge, uh, well, it's quite a big company. Uh, we have a big uh, plant in uh, Bruneck, uh, in the Puster Valley, and we have another plant in Milan. We have uh, uh, all in all 30 plants all over the world. I am managing uh, the global engineering. Uh, what are we doing? Uh, uh, it's, it's a little bit of tricky. Who doesn't know the technology? Carmen spoke a lot about, uh, about uh, Sinter, but it's uh, a little bit uh, a, a strange thing if, uh, if you're not used, if you don't know that. So allow me to invest just a, a few seconds in explaining you what, what we are doing. So uh, usually for uh, uh, making a metal component, you, have, uh, you start from the steel, so you melt the steel, you laminate the steel, then you make a forging, 
you make then the whole machining, uh, and then at the end you have your final component that you put then in your, uh, in your car. Uh, our process is a little bit different. So instead of uh, melting the steel into uh, lamination, into bars, we are producing powder. Powder is a solid without shape, so we need to bring this powder into shape. And there are quite complex uh, machines, uh, quite complex presses that are shaping the powder. After, the, uh, after uh, the shaping of the powder, we have a sintering process, which is basically we heat the components in a, in a reducing atmosphere, and then we have other secondary operation that are making then the powder, are turning the powder at the beginning to metal and to a metal component. Uh, you can have uh, any kind of components uh, in the car. Uh, mainly we are very, very active in the engine. We have uh, uh, oil pumps in the engine, in the transmission. Uh, you see this uh, big, uh, big carrier uh, for, uh, for the automatic transmission but also uh, in the several uh, uh, places uh, uh, in the car, uh, like the shock absorber, the steering. Uh, we, we are, every car of you, I guess, has a component from us. Um, how big are we? We are uh, a big global company, uh, one billion uh, uh, euro. We use pound because we have a British owner. <laughs> Uh, 1 billion euro for, uh, uh, of, of total sales. Uh, we have plants in uh, China, we have plants in India, we have two plants in China, two plants in India, one plant in Brazil, uh, and uh, several plants uh, between uh, uh, North America and, uh, and Mexico. 5,000 people uh, and more than uh, uh, 3,000 uh, 3, customers. Uh, we have several divisions. So we are making our own steel. So at the end of the day, we are also a big recycling company because we are buying scrap and selling components to the market. So we make our own steel. Uh, we have several plants uh, in, uh, in Europe, in China, in America, and in, uh, in Romania, actually here in Europe. Uh, we produce component. We have a, quite a big division uh, uh, of additive manufacturing. So we have several facilities uh, where we produce the uh, prototypes of, of any size. And then we are starting a new, a brand new business for magnet. Magnets are also coming from metal powder. Uh, it's not just steel, but uh, a little bit of more rare earth and uh, other yeah, allowing material. Uh, this is brand new, so uh, to, to cover the gap that uh, uh, the um, yeah, disappearing of the internal combustion engine is, uh, is bringing to the market, uh, we are now starting also an internal magnet, uh, magnet production. Uh, just a few numbers. Uh, we are a global leader in producing uh, components, uh, global leader in, uh, in powder, a few, a few uh, uh, yeah. customers, uh, overview of customer. We have uh, uh, car manufacturer, we have system producer, and we have also uh, industrials, so not, not automotive. Uh, yeah. We mentioned before how uh, electric cars uh, are, are growing, are coming to the, mar to the market uh, in a very fast way. But I'm going to give you a few numbers. So the yellow, um, we are taking this number and we are monitoring this number like every automotive uh, uh, com uh, company uh, from uh, IHS. IHS is basically a market institute. Uh, um, a market uh, a research institute, uh, uh, I think now it's property of Standard & Poor's, uh, uh, that it's uh, yeah, making a forecast on how the uh, market and the different architecture of the vehicle architecture are, are evolving. So uh, you see the, the yellow bar, it's, uh, it's increasing, and uh, we will have uh, uh, the majority of uh, uh, of the vehicle in 2035 uh, will, be, will be electric. 
Very interesting is the split in the continents. Uh, so you see that uh, from uh, uh, the overall uh, uh, bit, uh, uh, a big portion now is uh, in China. So now we have above 10 million cars in China. So every 10 electric cars in the world, probably eight are Chinese. And uh, <laughs> I took 10 times the taxi when I was in Shanghai last time. It was always electric. Always, always. Then last one I thought, oh, now it's a Tesla. No, it was a fake Tesla from BYD. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, really <laughs> it's, it's, it's really amazing uh, how, how the speed, but uh, we, are, we are used to the speed of China. So also in this case, uh, they are really uh, pushing, uh, pushing us to, to, to do better. So, um, yeah, um, you, you have two bars, uh, the bar uh, in front and the bar on the back. The bar on the back was the old one from March 2023, and the last one was from November. So you can see that the forecast, the global forecast, in uh, not even a year, increased uh, by 20%. So it's, it's, it's huge, it, it will come faster than we think. Um, yeah, I repeat a little bit uh, <laughs> what uh, Professor Renzi said uh, about uh, uh, the architecture of the vehicle. Um, we have been dealing for decades uh, with a combustion engine, cooling. So the combustion engine is a free source of heat so you take the engine for making the car going ahead, and uh, as a side effect, you have also a lot of heat that you need to cool down, but this is also very useful when you need to heat up uh, uh, the, uh, the space where the people are, are sitting. And all these things in an electric car are not there, so you need to, to optimize everything uh, um, that is uh, uh, related to, uh, to, uh, to, to heating, because uh, every um, inefficiency means a kilometer less in the range of the car. So even, uh, um, well, Carmen said about welding. Even welding uh, the battery cell to the next battery cell in the whole battery pack, even that welding, if this is not done properly, is taking away efficiency, it's taking away range of, uh, of the car. So, uh, what should we uh, cover in the whole thermal management? We cover mainly three things. And uh, uh, we have been speaking about this one and this one so far, not about the electric motor. But, uh, yes, battery needs to be heated up and cooled down because the battery is working in a very limited range. Uh, the power electronic, so the power electronic is basically taking the current from the battery and uh, transforming uh, the current, modulating the current to be used from the electric motor. Um, with our components, uh, so our technology, uh, we have several, several uh, way of cooling. Um, we mentioned air cooling, uh, we have liquid cooling, uh, and uh, we are very strong uh, in uh, uh, dielectric cooling and uh, oil cooling. Uh, because basically our material is very oil friendly. With uh, water glycol, uh, we are having some, some corrosion problems. Uh, so we, we are really specialized uh, in, in oil cooling, uh, and we are also pushing a little bit oil cooling because you don't have corrosion, uh, you have a, 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 a very wide uh, uh, tolerance of, of temperature, oil is always performing uh, uh, good, and uh, yes, and then uh, of course uh, um, other side advantages like protection against freezing, uh, and, and you can have really more, uh, more compact uh, uh, design. Um, in the past, uh, the very classic oil pump component has been this one. And this geometry is the typical geometry that is perfect for uh, the powder metallurgy technology because it's like an extrusion. The geometry is really, is, is really perfect. Uh, yeah, 
we, we are developing also a complete solution with the housing, with the cover, with the shaft, and we are moving as a company from just a component manufacturer to a, to a system provider. And of course, uh, uh, there are a lot of things behind this, uh, this small geometry that, is, uh, um, that seems uh, simple. The first one, for example, are, are the edges of this, uh, of, of this uh, rotor. Uh, we have really huge, complex machine just to brush the component, okay? And uh, uh, this is basically uh, the gap of the air you have uh, in the pump. And the smaller is this, the more efficient is the pump, and the more kilometer I can go ahead with my battery. Uh, also, the, the surface uh, uh, plays a, a, a crucial role in, uh, in, in the friction. And uh, uh, as I said, now we specialized from uh, the customer specification in designing uh, the component, in the um, finite element analysis uh, to uh, evaluate the deformation uh, under, uh, uh, under the load, and uh, yeah, and then at the end, uh, you need to close the circle and to test if what you designed was right or not. And we, uh, we developed in the past uh, years also a test to uh, a testing equipment to, to, uh, to make sure that everything is working okay as designed. And uh, basically, if you at the university need an oil pump for uh, the last project, uh, Contonals. <laughs> no, um, actually, this is uh, uh, the pump, uh, a pump for PSA, uh, where we are uh, that we are producing in our plant in Sandintaufers, uh, close to Bruneck, and uh, we are uh, also doing uh, after the whole assembly the end of line test that is giving really the the performance uh, of of the component. So. Oil cooling is for us uh, a, a crucial bit. Uh, we we uh, don't have oil cooling right now for the battery. We have the main uh, uh, application for oil cooling is uh, up to now the electric motor. Uh, but uh, yeah, we uh, we hope and we have the feeling that it's uh, it's improving uh, uh, because of the advantages that I mentioned at the at the very beginning. Water cooling. Uh, Yes, basically I repeat a little bit what <laughs> Carmen already said. Um, the power electronic needs uh, to be cooled down. Uh, I can have the air cooling, I can have the water glycol cooling, and uh, uh, the aluminum die casted is good, especially if you have some geometries on the top to maximize the exchange of the surface. Uh, but uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, we mention some hybrid solution, so we have uh, heat sinks, uh, so we have uh, a small piece of uh, other metals that can be uh, aluminum, that can be copper, uh, that, is, uh, that is used, uh, that is used uh, to, to cool down uh, the whole power electronic. Uh, it's crucial, uh, the choice of the material, it's crucial the, uh, the geometry, because the geometry is a, basically a compromise between the hy hydraulic loss of, of the water glycol flowing into that system and the heat exchange and maximizing the surface. So uh, we can offer, and we are doing also uh, finite element analysis, CFD simulation uh, for, for evaluating this, uh, this aspect, and we can offer different geometries on the market. And we saw sometimes that, uh, that, that it's uh, really, uh, sometimes all these pins, uh, there are three or four, uh, 30 or 40 pins that you can take away, and the result is, uh, is basically the same. Um, the other great thing that our technology, that powder metallurgy can offer is uh, the material flexibility. 
uh, we developed uh, an alloy, uh, an, an aluminum alloy, that is uh, uh, really far above uh, the die casted alloy. And that's mainly the reason because we are using uh, aluminum heat sink coming from our technology, powder metallurgy, into the die casting. So that's one point of synergy that we have also with, uh, with Alupress, actually. Uh, powder metallurgy has the advantage that you can play around with the material. So we can have uh, uh, metals, you can create metals that, uh, that cannot exist. So uh, so-called pseudo-alloys. So uh, uh, tungsten, uh, copper, uh, so that have uh, different melting points that you cannot create by other, other processes. Like for example, this is uh, uh, chromium copper. So with powder metallurgy, you can shape a chromium copper component. Uh, with no other technology, you can do that. Uh, you can see these, uh, these, uh, uh, this is copper powder. If you see these, these small uh, uh, white spots, these are synthetic diamonds. Okay? <laughs> so it's, it's not a diamond for the ring and everything. It's a little bit cheaper, but not so much cheaper. And uh, uh, the green line is uh, uh, 400 watt per meter Kelvin. Uh, that's the conductivity of copper. And we are far above, so we could reach uh, almost 550 with this, uh, yes, let's say, quite expensive material. Uh, so uh, this is just to give you a kind of a, of a flavor uh, how our technology can contribute uh, to the uh, to the big topic of the thermal management uh, in, in the battery cars. Industry is changing. Our company, and especially our technology, is a uh, must uh, rapidly adapt to this, uh, to this change. And for sure, the thermal management is uh, beside the battery and uh, uh, the actuation of uh, other mechanism in the car, it's our main focus uh, for, uh, for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. Very interesting, this uh, diamond-like uh, powder mixtures. So are there any questions from the audience? I assume that you use some kind of resin for the sintering to so only metal powder. Yes. Ah, okay. Because there are possibilities to use also resins that it sticks together better. And there I would be interested what is about the residues of these resins in the finished part. No, but uh, sintering uh, when, when you do the pressing of the green part. Yeah, my, my question was, my question was, if there, if you did chemical analysis of the bulk, if you can still find traces of these additives. Okay, thanks. Because I was really uh, looking for the carbon. That was what I was interested in. Okay. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so, Vincent. Thank you very much for your very interesting and well brought presentation. I was just wondering, do you see, uh, as you are present in the entire world, uh, differences in approach and in technology related to thermal management and in your, in your sector between China and Europe? Everybody uh, used uh, the 
solution they already have, uh, the, the, the case of the battery was really a, a, a rudimental welding, but uh, uh, speed. So they want to be first on the market. Uh, in uh, in uh, now, in, in, uh, uh, in these years, everybody is noticing, ah, okay, wait a minute, maybe this is not really optimal for an electric car, we use the other system. So there is now a big re-engineering wave, especially in Europe and, uh, and America, uh, uh, that, that everybody is redesigning the system. Uh, for example, the brakes. Uh, we used to have hydraulic brakes. Okay? Uh, to be very fast on the market, the very first electric cars used to have hydraulic brakes. Now, everybody is stepping into the electromechanical brakes because it's taking less energy. Energy, battery, range. So, uh, uh, I see a, a big re-engineering uh, wave now, and, and it's uh, basically our, our big opportunity. To come back to your question, uh, the solutions are quite, uh, quite very similar. Um, in China, uh, uh, the speed is, uh, is uh, bigger. They like more uh, uh, the axial flux motors, so this, this pancake motor. You see this in pumps, uh, in, you, you see this kind uh, of, of, of stuff more in, uh, in, in China. And uh, yeah, and of course, uh, uh, the level of optimization. solution but very fast. Here we are re-engineering basically everything. Probably in five, ten years, also in China, also Chinese will look for more money and uh, optimize it. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. <laughs> so I think now it's time for a coffee. So enjoy networking and uh, let us meet again at four o'clock here in this room for uh, for the second part where you will hear the uh, so now until now we heard the the cool presentations so focused on cooling and then after the break we'll hear so the people who who generate the heat so the electronics guys <laughs>